Hey, Alyssa. So it seems like the last couple of chats have been post con, post uh, uh, con chats. That's like becoming a theme here. Uh, but first of all, how are you? How are things in the I world? I am very well. How are you, sir? I am doing doing excellent. Um, now, I guess we'll get into it. But uh, are you? Is uh, did you turn in your final uh, gaslight map that is behind you? Is that nope. I'm going to keep <laughs> throwing labels on it until they tell me to stop. <laughs> All right, so, they, so what they what they tell you, just keep going, keep doing what you're doing? Um, well, I think, you know, basically right now um, they're not ready for it. You know, I think if they were moving into layout, they would be wanting this map. I've done the map. It's finished. Um, but I'm preparing a poster version of it, which means labeling every street and every alleyway until I run out of time. So it's kind of like a little quirky side project almost for me. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I think they're focusing on a lot of other good, super sexy things. This is definitely going to be a thing. I think just they've got a little bit of time. When they want it, you know, they'll they'll let me know. I, otherwise, I keep them appraised of where I'm at. All right. Uh, I mean, that's cool. As you're getting more time, it seems like the more stuff you can do with that, just the more tweaking. I mean, it looks better and better every time every time I see it. I kind of want to be done with it in about a month, though. You know. It, it, I'm not sure this version. Yeah, the version that's behind me has got a lot more labels uh, on it. But you can see this. There's entire roads, etc., that don't have labels on them yet. So I kind of want to. I want to spend maybe another twenty hours, forty hours putting labels on it, and then I'll just call it a day. Then, then we'll be done. Cool. And then you said you're taking right. You're taking the rest of this year off, right, to work on your own. Uh, or... Kind of. Sort no, uh, so oh. updates, updates from the Faden household. I am going to be drawing uh, a Greyhawk city map once Ooh. a quarter. Um, and Luke Gygax had me as a stretch goal in his recent Kickstarter, which funded only a few days ago. And he more than got his stretch goal. So I'm going to be doing some maps for him too. So I'm still doing maps for folks. They just have to be super interesting not conflict with anything else and i'm going to insert more of me drawing maps like what's behind me nice because yeah because i know you said you want to look at some other other cities and kind of do some other kind of historical maps but congrats on doing the stuff for luke what what is the uh is the uh, greyhawk map for him as well or is that for something else no uh there's a guy called christoph and he's got uh, like a greyhawk zine for want of a better uh, <laughs> thing and i don't know the name of it I, I and my apologies christoph for that but basically he spoke to me gary khan was like would you be willing to draw you know a, a city map once per quarter for me and i gotta be honest with you gray hawk's always been very intimidating it comes with lots of book reading and adhering to canon and i don't want to deal with that i just don't i don't have the time um but he's like reassured me that I'll be doing locations that don't have any law uh, or, or they don't have any uh, previous scenarios, canon information about them. No one that really knows much about um, what they are other than a marking on a map. So under that, I was like, yeah, sure, I I'll do it. So at least one city map every quarter, I suppose, for them. Wow, that'll be really cool. Um yeah, that seems like a neat, neat project. I was wondering. I was just thinking about it. I obviously, I'm sure you don't know, but I, like, uh, it's like the it's Greyhawk. Like, is it in the, is the name in the public domain or something? I would have thought that people would have been like, hey, 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 Greyhawk, not so fast. But I guess maybe he has permissions or whatever he has. No, no, no. You're right, and it's a really good question uh, because obviously, I do the fantasy mapping show with Anna Maya, right? And Anna Maya uh, does nothing but Greyhawk. It's super high resolution over like maps and, and she's an expert. She's a spot on the subject. And I, I was sitting there thinking, well, how come Watsy just isn't like, stop that, stop that. Okay. Well, apparently, and they have it on their website that they're actually okay with bands creating content that are like in the world of Greyhawk uh, or just generically, you just can't sell it. And so, so but I guess this zine is going to be kind of a, a gray area, though, right? Because I assume he's going to be selling it. I, I mean, I mean, people put out free zines before, but presumably he's spending money on it, so he's going to be sending it. Well, 
<laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, hopefully, folks, you'll get your Greyhawk zines before. Apparently, I mean, they are aware of, of this stuff going on. They're aware of Animaya. They don't seem to have a problem with it at all. You know, yeah, go and create your artwork based upon Greyhawk. You're fine. Don't sweat it. I'm sure if you did a new TSR thing and then claimed that it was your setting, <laughs> they, they would have something to say about it. Yeah, but yes, any, 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 yes. I think we, we we've got a we've had a good, very, very recent case in point of of what not to do when attempting to attempting to uh, access, I guess, older, maybe partially forgotten or not IPs. Um, but on to Chaosium Con. So this was their first one, right? Uh, well, how was it? I mean, I guess take us from A to A to Z on the on the Chaosium Con experience. Yeah, absolutely. So Chaosium Con was a two day convention that I think was held on the seventh, eighth, and ninth, eighth and ninth of this month. It was a Friday and Saturday of this month. So it was two days, two and a half days. If you attended the dinner that was on the Thursday night before, and a lot of people did. There was a hundred sort of seats available to it, and. It, no, it was good. The, uh, you know, let me walk you through it. You know, we arrived on Thursday. The hotel, um, God, you're going to ask me the name of the hotel, but don't. <laughs> don't. As long as it's not the it, Overlook Hotel. Sorry. No, it, it's it's in Detroit, and you, you you go, Detroit, what? But there was a really nice area in Detroit uh, surrounded by a golf course. And when you're surrounded by a golf course, a hotel in the center of it always tends to have something nice going on. And it was a real nice, stylish hotel kind of wrapping around water features and ponds and stuff. It was, it was kind of high wow. class. They'd clearly been renovating the interior of it. So it was very – it had a great ambience – People were beginning to trickle in already. Um, you could see the Call of Cthulhu t-shirts and sweatshirts, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not going to knock the hotel. They, they struggled because I don't think they realized that 300 people were turning up for the convention. And so their catering side definitely struggled. Uh, That's all I'm going to say on that. And I could say a lot. Um, <laughs> but the, the convention itself, they definitely... This was their first one. They, they've definitely gone through a couple of teething problems, things like badges not being available to pick up, you know, the night before or even the morning of, uh, lanyards not being available until partway through the first day, you know, little sort of organisational things. Um, but otherwise, uh, they had the entire Chaosium crew. And God, there has to be like 20 of those people. They And they were bringing them in from England. There's a lot of Chaosium folks in England. So, the, you know, it, it, it was good to see them kind of really, I mean, they've been around since the 80s, man. I mean, and this is the first time that they've done a convention and they have adoring fans all over the world. So to see them open up their doors, so to speak, and like they and they're all every single person on the KSM crew is very approachable, very like loving and, and great with their fans. So it was. It was just. It was good. It was a good experience. Did they? Uh, so yeah. I, you know. I imagine because you think, well, three hundred people's not a, not a ton compared to some of the other mega mega, mega uh, sort of cons that are around. But I imagine if you were a super chaosing fan, this would have been great because it's small enough at, at this kind of beginning where you can kind of find yourself talking to folks from Chaosium and really kind of talk to them as opposed to when you get to a, a bigger. You know, ho hopefully they'll keep doing this year after year, and at some point it just gets too big. Where even if you want to find them, like it's just hard. It's hard to find them in the people. It's hard to find them because they've already been going off and doing all kinds of stuff. But here it's kind of s still at that kind of small stage where you can really sort of find people and run into them, you know, on on a personal level and and chat. I'm sure. I'm sure in five years' time, people will be complaining that it's got too big. <laughs> and they can't talk to the Mike Masons and the Lynn Hardys of this world. Uh, but yeah, it made the, it made everyone very accessible. Uh, the bar area, which I think is important for in between games and in the evening, being able to chill out somewhere that's got a great ambience uh, was nice. And being able to sort of chat with Lynn Hardy and Mike Mason and Rick, their sort of president, was kind of really cool. Uh, you're you're 100% right. Uh did they it was there any thought or did you hear any kind of why they chose now to, to launch it as opposed to a year from now or why they didn't do it pre just i honestly don't know i honestly don't know um that i think is a great subject and a great question but i don't know why it took them shall we say so long to do a convention uh, but now they have i'm, I'm sure we're going to see them every year 
Oh, I hope so, because I, I, I would love to go to one down the line. I, I'm, I guess I'll be curious if they keep it in Detroit. Are, are they from Detroit? Is there some connection between the company and Detroit? You know, um, I, I believe there is. I, I thought that like their their hometown is from there. But let me just do a quick uh, uh, like I want to say it was Ann, Ann Arbor, yeah, okay. Ann Arbor, yeah. Michigan. All right, so there is like a Michigan connection. That's cool. That's always cool. Uh, yeah, and it was like place. the Eagle Crest Golf Resort and Convention Center, which was really really nice. About. 20 minutes away from the Detroit airport. And, but and, really and, nice and the lot, At least you can get there, everybody, because, you know, I, 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 I want to go to Gary Con and some of those, but, man, getting to Lake Geneva is not not easy from these coasts, where it's very easy to, very easy to get to Detroit. Uh, was there a keynote or somebody giving, like, an opening ceremony speech combo? Anything you know, like I thought I thought there was going to be a little bit more of a keynote. I mean, there was. There was a short address by Rick. Um, on that, I'm going to call it the VIP dinner, but it wasn't a VIP dinner, really. You know, you pay your $100, you get to attend uh, if, if you're one of the 100. And, and so, yeah, he did a he did a sort of, sort of speech for everyone at, at the beginning of it, that, which was a, set a nice tone for the weekend. Anything interesting in the speech? Anything? Well, it was more, it was more um, what they then started to talk about at the convention itself. Um, because they started to talk about their next projects coming up. Um, they did a lot of seminars on that type of thing. And so it was less of talking about the projects coming up at the dinner, where let's say you've only got 100 people attending, and talking about the projects coming up at seminars and things. So that's kind of the way they structured it. And there was there was actually a big one called oh. Rivers of London. And Rivers of London is an extremely popular book series. And I've never that, heard of it. Is it? Is it? That's English? the secret map that I've been working on for them. Ah, oh, ha, ha. So, well, tell me about Rivers of London. Why well, I've never heard. Of, is this something that's like it? It's a it's a British or English series, or what's the what's the scale? I, I think I believe it is a British series. It's ex, uh, very very popular by all accounts. Um, I think he's up to like five or six books now, or something like that. I could be mistaken. Um, they're gobbled up every single time he releases one, and Chaosium have made an arrangement to wow. release a Rivers of London um, source book and adventures. So, just for the folks in the U.S., though, it has a different name apparently. According to so, I've got Rivers of London, the novel on Wikipedia, and according to Wikipedia, the name of the novel in uh, the U.S. is Midnight Riot. Why? For whatever reason. <laughs> and he is an English author, Ben Aranovich. Uh, I have no idea. It was the, I guess the re- first one was released in 2011. Sometimes it's always weird when they change the names of things. Yeah, and you and you wonder why 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 are you changing it? But I I, I don't know. They I, I'm sure they had their reasons. But yeah, so the first book, and and maybe the series they kept is because I guess it's both because the R- Rivers of London apparently was the first book in a series that's also called Rivers of London. I don't know if it's maybe they kept the name of the series and for the U.S. but changed the first book to Midnight. I don't know. It's Midnight Riot here. If anyone goes looking it up and wants to check it out, and they can't find Rivers of London, whatever it's it, it could be called Midnight Midnight Riot. No reason on Wikipedia is given. Yeah, and I just did a quick search on Reddit, and they don't know either. Apparently, even <laughs> the author doesn't know why it was changed. That's an Americanism right there. That's an Americanism. This is so goofy. I, I remember famously uh, the translation of Tintin in English. They took the the dog, you know. And, and have you ever read Tintin, you know, or the comic Tintin? Or you yes. saw the movie, whatever. He has a dog. The dog in French, her, her name is Milou, which was like his old love who he lost. But then he named the dog. After. Like, there's like, like a really nice backstory. In English, it just becomes snowy because it's white, you know, color. It's like, why? Like you had this great backstory with his lost love and the dog, and it says something about its connection, and all that. Now we're just gonna call her Snowy. Okay, guess. <laughs> I, I don't know why they do that. They did that with the film um, The Professional or Leon. Um, have you ever heard of that? Of course, I know. I know that very well. Yeah, yeah they changed I, the name in England. What is it? In, is it in England something different than? Is it not The Professional, nor is it Leon? It's called Leon. Oh, it's called Leon. I think. Because I don't, you see, I'm trying to, because I remember it ended up getting like two names. Because I remember originally going way back when you were starting, well, starting to buy movies on DVD. Because they had like the professional, 
but then you could get the director's cut, which was Leon the Professional. I, I, I don't know. They, I, I don't. I don't even know what the French word is called. But it's just yeah. It's just the, when they change the name stuff, it's really weird. Um, what kind of? I, I haven't read here on on uh, on. Is this so? I, I assume. Should I assume that that Rivers of London is some kind of horror eldritch? Some kind of. Well, you know, and that's a really good question because I've not read the box. I honestly don't know from firsthand experience, but I believe it is a very good. Oh, here we go. I, I got it. I, well, I got us. It seems like I, I don't want to get out of turn here, but I I feel like I'm getting kind of I don't want to say Hellboy vibes, but kind of one of these things. So here. Again, this is Wikipedia, so who knows okay. how correct it is. But it says that, uh, speaking of, this is the first novel, Rivers of London, a.k.a. Midnight Riot. The novel centers on the adventures of Peter Grant, a young officer in the Metropolitan Police, who, following an unexpected encounter with a ghost, is recruited into the small branch of the Met that deals with magic and the supernatural. Peter Grant, having become the first English apprentice wizard in over 70 years, must immediately deal with two different but ultimately interrelated cases. In one, he must find what is possessing ordinary people and turning them into vicious killers. And in the second, he must broker a peace between the two warring gods of the River Thames and their respective families. That, so, doesn't that sound Cthulhu-esque? It does, kind of John Constantine. You uh, could drop that into Cthulhu in a heartbeat. No wonder Chaos soon reached out. And yes, yeah, so this potion is 2011. I don't know if he's still making books, but it's almost like... No, he is. Fit. No, he okay. is still making books. Yeah. Very cool. So, so that uh, that one caused um, a little bit of a stir when they announced that one. Now they actually can't show any content, so they can't show my map. There's some something as part of the agreement. They okay. can say they're doing it, and they announced it at Chaos Income, but they can't actually reveal anything inside the book. Interesting. And and, and so when is that? When does that NDA or, or whatever it is would be? I honest, I don't know. I don't know. Chaosium has been talking openly about it. They've actually posted the cover of the book recently on their own channels ever since the convention. I don't know when they're going to be allowed to talk about the interior. I have no idea. Well, we got stuff to look forward to. So so that was their big... Now, did they put that out up front or did they save that for the end as kind of the grand... No, that was, that was mentioned pretty early on. Um one of the uh, one of the other things that they mentioned actually was by Mike Mason. I was on a, a panel um, Saturday morning. Oh with yeah, Mike I definitely Mason. want you to go into detail about that as well. Well, it, it was with right Mike now, Mason. Before. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say if you want to get into your panel and just in depth. Well, okay. you know, I, I'm not going to recreate the panel here, you know. But it, it was Mike Mason and uh, Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan is their cartographer. He does yeah. like ninety percent of their maps. Very nice guy. Um, so we did a panel, we did a mapping panel, and Mike Mason was on it from the point of view of as a as an author, as a writer, and as a creative lead, you know, what what, what are his considerations and as he's working with cartographers. So it was kind of interesting from that perspective. There was a nice crowd uh, that attended, and Mike actually said partway through, because we were talking about my gaslight map, um, that uh they actually they're going to for the first time ever do a gaslight like campaign and uh, which they've not done before and apparently i'm going to do the maps for that too so that was and i found that out during the actual <laughs> the seminar nice so the, the, they have you guys get in the ring and duke it out two two mappers enter one mapper will leave cartographers challenge no, like matt, matt matt is their guy he's their guy and he does great maps too and i'm talking about kick-ass maps like it's moving chaosium onto a whole new level um and the types of thing he does i don't do you know the overland maps even i'm going to say the city maps which is going to make you go uh, or the town maps like that you know but like he does like your, your all the building plans he does that and they look super polished um but then when it comes to stupid like is she insane details like this this is kind of like my forte so i can imagine i'll be doing towns and cities for them matt will do all of the others which is a fine arrangement to me and uh yeah and it seems like you guys compliment like you're saying kind of skill strengths because i i don't i don't want to draw buildings i got no interest in drawing buildings <laughs> you know and matt can do the outside you know like you're you're looking at it mm. and then he can break down into an architectural plan and honestly that's not the thing i do very nice. So, what were the main points of discussion? What was the? Were there anything interesting takeaways from this kind of a creator and cartographer relationship? 
yeah, I think one of the big ones was, um, you know, what cartographers look for in starting a project, the information that we're trying to get out of uh, the beginning of a project and that whole sort of, uh, I'm going to call it requirements gathering. Uh, and Mike sort of then talking about from his perspective, like when he's asking, let's say, um, Matt or myself to draw a map, what type of information he looks to provide. And that was kind of an interesting discussion because a lot of people don't know what an artist or a cartographer needs. And so, you know, they tend to, some people approach it more from the point of view of, hey, I've got a map that I need to have done. How much will it cost? And that's that's that tells us nothing right <laughs> i can't draw it i can't even visualize it so it, that was a great discussion i saw a lot of people sort of taking notes on that because i think I there bet. were people there that would want to like approach artists or uh, you know for their own stuff that they're doing uh, from an indie perspective or maybe they are artists in their own right and so they were kind of taking notes of about the type of things that matt and i look for but how we extract from the clients if we don't get it yeah. So, so what are the, what would you say you, you feel like you need if someone were to come up to you and let's say you, you were, you had a space in your schedule for commissions, what kind of, what are, what are the, the few, the top few things that you would say as so as someone coming to you that you would ask them to have kind of on hand? Well, you always start with the, what am I drawing? That sounds like an obvious thing, but so many people don't give you that basic information. They'll start with, Hey, I, I, are you open for commissions? I need something, you know, or, uh, I, I need a map. How much is it going to cost? And uh, that's fine. That's like saying I, I need a house. How much is it going to cost? <laughs> right. But you've got to you've got to layer in some details. Right. And if you think of it in terms of houses, like how big? What is the basic floor plan? You know, or, or what is the basic floor sort of space that we're looking at here? How many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? How many garage? Uh, you know, garages do you need? And maps are the same way. Let's start at the beginning. Am I drawing a, a, a world map? Am I doing a country? Am I doing an overland map? Am I drawing a building? Am I doing a city? There's a big difference between drawing London and drawing, let's say, even Chester, where I come from. Chester's a lot smaller than London. So give me the basics about what I'm going to be drawing. And if you don't know, because it's more like, well, it's a fantasy town, okay, Give me a little bit about the population, the general sort of size. Uh, is it black and white? Is it color? Um, what's the print size that we're looking at here? Um, those can that then allows me to start to focus on you know um, what I would be drawing. Gives me a sense of the size and the detail that I'm going to be drawing. At that point, I can start to formulate an, an idea of how long it's going to take me and ergo what the cost is going to be. And then there's always going to start the next layer, peel back the layer of that onion is going to be, okay, so now I'm going to actually pencil sketch this thing out, but I need to know, it, do you have a shape of the town or city in mind? Is it on the coastline of a lake or the sea? Was it in the middle of nowhere? Does it have any hills or mountains or cliffs around it? What are the main geographic features that create the shape, the canvas, so to speak, that this goes on? And it's 50-50, actually, whether an author knows or not. Some authors are very particular, and I want to talk about that in a moment. And some authors actually don't know. You, you might get something like, and I've had this. Well, it's on a river estuary. And it's run by a council of three people who have been in charge for the last 50 years. Well, and now we're going into a realm where it tells me nothing, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, but is it on a hill? You know, are there any islands, you know, in the river estuary? So I start to look for shapes that need to be on the map. Let's call them big POIs. And there's a flip side, which will literally give you a book and say, this will tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> and it's like, I'm not going to read a book for the shape of this city and the main geographic features around it. I'm just not going to do it unless you're going to pay me for it. <laughs> and that comes up How a about lot. You wrote the book. How about you just bottom line? Distill it, what right? <laughs> I, I don't, I, I mean, you can tell me, like, you know, the because the next tear down will be is there a particular culture we're trying to, uh, like, evoke here uh, that we're trying to capture? That's that's relevant. If you want to say, well, it, this is a place that's kind of Mediterranean, cool. 
I kind of know what the coloring and the building style it's going to look like. I get that. It's fine. But if you then go off into, and the main trade is salt and myrrh, and they, they earn great income from steel, which they, they you know, I, I don't care. I don't care. I mean, like, <laughs> give me shapes. So that's a big one. And then, uh, you know, even then, a lot of people will not, I'll get some that will actually be able to sketch out the shape and mark temple district here garden district here that's great i've had that several times and then i'll get others that say oh i don't know and with those i'll sketch it and typically i'll sketch several different shapes and like almost swatches and say pick the coastline you want from the six different sketches pick the river shape you want from the different sketches Pick the shape of the city and the shape of the walls from the different sketches so they can mix and match. And then I just start easing it forward, you know, basically taking the details from them as I can extract it. Yeah, I imagine there's a real, uh, it's probably one of those underlooked kind of creator skills is folks who can really kind of distill their stuff down to what they need when they're working with other people, if it's cartographers or whether it's kind of uh, publishers or printers or whatever, being able to really kind of get that stuff as opposed to, um having a lot of kind of dithering or just unknowns or just kind of being just dis or disorganized with your own um i guess ip or content or whatever you want to call it um so how did you enjoy was that, that now was that the first kind of uh panel that you'd been on as a presenter have you done panels before no i've done panels uh, okay. a lot I, I like being on panels so panels are fun um this is obviously the first one for the chaos of god but no it, it's it, it, i've been on panels i want to say never convention i've been to nice uh was it well attended a lot of people show up for years yes no i was quite happy with it because sometimes you can be on a panel and you'll have a few people turn up i've had those um other times you can be on uh, in a panel or something and have a room full and i've had those too obviously the more people that are in a room the better because you get the you get not any better energy but lots of questions and things so it becomes easy then to have the conversation it's disheartening if you're there for the panel and there are only three people in the in the room you know they're more panelists than people it's kind of a, like oh uh, okay uh and, you know not that i know from ex experience but uh, you know that would be my my sense of it did they do a good job spacing out these different seminars so that you know they could because i sometimes it's just it's difficult right the timing of things can be that you want to go to this thing but then this other event's happening at the same time and so you have to make those kind of choices but Maybe with a smaller con, they're able to kind of spread things out too. No, I think so. My observation from the con, from that perspective, is they probably had they had a good selection of panels going on. Um, you know, if you've got someone like Peterson talking about writing, uh, you know, techniques um, or horror writing techniques, then that's a great panel to go to, and they had a lot like that happening. Um, I don't look, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think it's so much about the spacing of them. They didn't struggle from that. They, you know, they had stuff going on all of the time, but they had a lot of games going on too. So it was really, it was just a constant choice of like, you know, are you, am I playing games? Am I going to a panel? If anything, I would like to have seen them have more games going on. Um, you know, one of the things when you're running a convention uh, is you obviously need GMs to run games for you. And you sometimes have to drum that up like you know you'll see the likes of game hole or gary khan like months ahead of time saying we need games guys gms get your games in get your games in and they offer incentives too you know like extra swag or whatever it's gonna be to, for the gms to do it but there's a constant gms we need your games we need your games um chaosium had more room than they did games hmm. and their pacing of releasing those games was basically a free for all. It's like game registration open, and they wiped out very quickly. The games filled; they filled instantly. So if you came in a day or two later, like me and my husband, <laughs> they were gone. You had slim pay. I'm talking gone. You know, we managed to get one game, and then another one was added a little bit later on, like two weeks after the fact. And we just happened to be looking at the screen at the time and managed to get a position on that. So we had two games for six sessions, and 
that's the worst I've had in any convention uh, from a ratio perspective. Because most most conventions, even if you don't want to, if you don't get the game that you hope to get into, because it is, it's a bum rush, man. Every single time it's like event registration open, everyone's fighting for the big, huge games. Um, and I get it because I'm a GM on the other side and my games fill up quickly. And there's always a lot of people that don't get in and they wish they had. So I understand it. But there are ways to kind of open the gates slowly. Like I think GaryCon, for example, you know, allows their Diamond members to go first. Then the following week, they allow their Platinum and then their Gold and then their Silver. Um, North Texas... If that's a smaller convention. North Texas only has about 500 people or so that attend. North Texas, you know, opened the gates a little bit early, but only had, let's say, two positions open at each game. So all of the games could not sell out. Mm. Then they opened up a couple more positions and a couple more positions. So that, I think, is a better way of going about it. And But that's one of the teething problems that I think, hopefully, Chaosium will get down, where they get more games, they hustle GMs more, maybe offer more incentives for people to GM and don't do the bum rush gates open bah, horde. Because yeah. if you're not there when those gates open, you're out of luck. <laughs> you're out of luck, yeah. Do you feel like that they didn't have enough G GMs and that's what caused Because, I mean, sometimes you get, feel like you can have a ton of GMs, but still just they just fill up. They the... didn't have enough. Okay. They didn't have enough. And I don't – I've run – conventions okay i have one uh for about three years it was a war gaming convention but it was a similar principle we knew we knew our slots we knew our tables and we knew down to each time um zone district uh slot segment, um segment thank you um where there were spare tables and what we did is anytime let's say friday afternoon is still quiet we would say Friday afternoon, GMs, we need we have Friday afternoon slots. Come on, put your games in, put your games in. Uh, you know, Saturday afternoon, come on, we, we have seven tables still open. So we had our finger on the pulse to a high degree. Now, I'm going to guess that Chaosium did too. How could you not? You know your rooms, you know your tables. And either, the, and I, I don't believe this, but I'll say it. Either the person that was taking in the events was not paying attention to that, which is possible. Or he just wasn't looking for it. Or honestly, maybe there was a breakdown because that same guy isn't going to be a person doing your social media. And I think there was a breakdown there. I mean, honestly, I think there was a potential breakdown from that point of view. I don't want to talk for KSM at all. But, you know, their main website never updated during this whole countdown to the convention itself. Really? No, it mentioned the convention. It said, and we're hoping to have vendors uh, be there. And it was all, that was their first post. And that initial post never got updated oh again. Oh, my gosh. So I feel like, you know, there uh, there was a disconnect with then the outreach in the media, so to speak, the social media, to keep the news out there, keep the conversation going, and keep pulling those GMs in. Maybe there was somebody wearing too many hats. and Because, you know, especially with your first one going, probably have people who were just, just so much going on that maybe that particular element just kind of slid off, slid off their plate, and they weren't able. I to actually, pick it up again. I spoke to the event coordinator uh, at the beginning of the convention, during the convention, at the end of the convention. Funny enough, <laughs> and he was on his own. And at the end, a very nice guy, by the way, well, really sweet guy. Uh, but at the end of the convention, he was like, I thought I would actually be able to stand around a little bit, answer some questions, and maybe play some games. He was like. I needed help. So <laughs> I, I, I've got to be honest with you, you know, at Enfilad, the Wargaming Convention, which I helped out with for a few years, um, there was, I want to say there was something like six of us, you know, uh, uh, with hands on deck and we had volunteers. Now, of course, Chaosium had a lot of volunteers. They had the people manning like the tables and the booths and things like that. Of course they did. But event coordination never just fell down to just me. There was always a few of us keeping the wheels moving. And maybe they just needed a couple more hands on deck. Yeah, they might have just underestimated what it was. They thought, like, oh, I can handle it by myself and have time to spare. And at the end of it, you're like, nope, not only could I, not could I, I didn't have any time to spare, but I need I need more people. It well, happens. and I think, you know, if this is your first, right, you yeah. find out almost the hard way, like, 
suddenly it's, you're buried under it. You go, oh my God, I'll learn from this next That's year. True. What is it like? What are all the plans until first contact with the enemy? Well, like, I'm sure all their right. great ideas yeah. for how it was going to work went out the window exactly. as, soon, as soon as that Saturday hit. Uh, were there any particular themes about the seminars and things other than, I mean, was it just kind of products? Was it, I mean, I, I guess there were elements of stuff about kind of content creation or was it more about just like talking about stuff that they're doing kind of q a type stuff or oh it was all over it it, it covered the, the whole gamut and I, I should emphasize you know it was probably 70 percent games 30 percent seminars and panels you know but the panels r r ran the range of like you know horror story writing and design to you know maybe lynn hardy talking about writing in general to talking about projects coming up they they were all over and you have to remember too chaosium are well known for call of cthulhu but they also do rune quest and so on and so forth as well you know they have several settings out there that they are and they they were running games and doing panels for all of them were they trying to keep it kind of evenly split or was there a focus on more on cthulhu or more or were they trying to kind of keep sort of equal representation? I want to say it was fairly evenly split. My focus was on um, Call of Cthulhu. And it, I'm going to guess that it is the bigger product. But, you know, RuneQuest was re well represented there from a game perspective and a panel perspective. So, you know, it, it, and they had new books there at the vendor hall too for RuneQuest and lots of them. So apparently it's a popular products i mean it's been around for a long time i mean I yeah it's, you know since the 80s also maybe even earlier uh did you uh other than your the panel that you were on did you attend other panels i didn't um there was one panel i was going to go to which was uh, i think peterson's writing horror writing and i thought oh this could be useful from a point of view of a gm like writing my own content and everything um but i had someone sit with me um and want to talk and so i spoke to him <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's what that's what happens too so uh you guys got into two games so with, how, how how were your two games what were they how were they okay so at every convention you go to there is a risk unless you know the gm which is why certain gms are highly sought after there is a risk that the game is going to be good or not. I mean, that's just a reality of conventions. Not every single keeper GM is a great one. They're just not. I mean, if, this goes true for any convention, any game system. And going back to Game Hole or Total Con or Gary Con, uh, it's 50-50 whether you're going to get a good game or not. Hopefully you have an entertaining game. And some of that is down to your fellow players. It's a crapshoot. I mean, Very it is. So. And I say that as a preface to um, our first game could have been better. <laughs> and GM, if you watch this video after the fact, my apologies, but it's true. Um, it was a RuneQuest game. Um, it actually brought back a lot of memories for me because I played it in the 80s and 90s. I haven't played it since. It was Jack's first experience of RuneQuest. Um, it was second edition, I think. So it was like old character sheets and stuff. But this was a guy that clearly knew the law and the setting to the point where it became a distraction and it was instead of the adventure, if that makes sense. It does. Um, it, does it, it was like, yeah, you can name drop the, the location we're in and the season and the, the, the holiday and the name of the town we're in. And you could do all of that. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Oh, I remember that. But it had nothing to do with the adventure. Um, it, it it clearly was a brain flex. He knew what he was doing. But, like, the actual game itself, it didn't have a hook. It was like your soldiers, um, you're, you know, taking some leave, and you've decided that you're going to go to a nearby swamp for your leave. And so already you're going... Their okay. Purposes is the mud good for your skin? <laughs> and there was none of that. There was none of that. 
Um, and there could have been so many reasons to actually go to the swamp, right? So many reasons for the. You could have been sent there on orders. Yeah, I don't, I don't to even go know why. Why are you on leave? Just have your commanding officer that says this guy got lost in the swamp. But go get him or something. Right, and then and then it was basically so you arrive at town, <laughs> and so we're like, okay, so we're on leave. We're just chilling. So we're shopping for souvenirs. We're buying food. We're not doing anything you know and, and so it was like so is there anything to do and, and he it seemed like, kind of over overly content just to ex use all these things just to talk more about the town and the lore and all it was a while. little bit like that right and then so it was like you know one of the npc says it was what you could do was swamp tour and it's like ah <laughs> okay so there's the little bouncing exclamation over the npc's <laughs> yeah. head it's the guy yeah. waiting at the boat you know <laughs> And then once we got into the swamp, it was fine, but it, it and it was just fine. But it was like it was there could have been so many reasons to have a group of soldiers go to the swamp, commandeer a boat, commandeer a navigator, get to the central island because you're looking for X, Y, or Z. I, I, I do feel you know? like that there is a there is a skill of running one shots, and I think something that a lot of folks don't get is with a one shot, you kind of have to. You know, because the whole the, the, the whole thing of like, I don't want to be a railroading GM. I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to force you. When you're in a one shot in a con setting, you have three or four hours to play the game. You kind of have to. You got it. Because <laughs> no one's there to really shop in town. But if you're left with nothing else to do, you're gonna end up wasting time. Like, oh, I guess I'll walk around, and then hopefully the one NPC I talk to will be the one that will point me over. Just put you in the swamp. Like, I, if, if my game would have been like, you're in the swamp. Like, you've already pushed off from town. You do whatever and go right like like that's what you want you just want to be like in you it. got but, four hours right you got four, four hours, hours. For this thing. so dithering in the town in the kind of pre-quest area is not not helpful but it's hard because i think a lot of times gms you know, they want to be good they want to be like i don't want to be i don't want to force them to go but you're here to take the swamp tour put everybody <laughs> put everybody on the swamp tour 100 percent, 100 percent. um the other thing was the second game though the second game was um was a success um and so gm if you're out there and you watch this later on thank <laughs> you it was an awesome game and out of everyone at the table i probably knew about five of the other players it was just a lot of my friends that sat down at the oh, table okay. that always makes it uh, fun so that obviously helps it did mean that we were a little boisterous but the gm took it in his stride and it was a great it was a great idea it's like it's 1920s it's the uh, almost golden era of movies it's the birth of movies in many ways uh, but we're not into um the talkies yet and we were all different types of characters that had a tie-in with this particular movie studio um that were doing a big gala night for a talkie and but we had been tipped off that something was amiss with this oh. we had to do a little bit of investigation and one of our one of our crew he had actually invented the the talkie sort of technology and had it stolen from him by the studio so he's there to try and actually get his stuff back and figure out what's going on you know we all had a beef with the studio that was the thing and it was great. So it was a great setting. We were in Hollywood. We're, you know, we're investigators. We're an inventor. We all had great, uh, you know, compelling characters. And we we had a blast with it. You know, it was a lot of fun and a very plausible, well um, crafted adventure. That and it was somebody was nicely. This somebody's homebrew. This was just their own. S someone's homebrew. Nice. So, he, so he, what, Eldritch, uh, what Eldritch Horror was behind it all? The, the nefarious. Well, there was no big god uh, it, but it was the you know the studio was having people sign contracts you know with them and it, what not just us but it could be actors and everything but the pen and the paper and the contract they were signing was basically signing their soul away and they actually would uh, they would actually go into almost the dreamlands they would disappear um and that's or, or like end up like sort of being discarded on the side of the road which is what happened to our inventor but he signed away his invention he was kind of cast under a spell but the actual studio was then tapping into all of these souls that they'd taken into the dreamlands and they had a special camera that they were using 
to create the talkies, but all of oh. the actors, none of it was real. They're all from the dreamlands, you know? Oh, that's very cool. So it was kind of cool. Of paradise in there. Uh, and that, that archive 81 a little bit. Had some yeah, totally. Really cool, really cool stuff. Well, who did you play? What was your character? Um, no, let me think about it for a moment. Um, I, oh, I was like a private investigator. And um, I decided I was going to model him on, I think the guy's name is Hank from Breaking Bad. Um, so a little overweight, a little balding. Um, you know, he's got his little revolver, but he, he's, he's there to sort of figure out what's going on with this studio. So it, that, that was my character. And, and we had the actress in the group too, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> had been promised, you know, a role in the studio, didn't get it. So she's looking for dirt. It was kind of cool. What, what did your husband play? Oh God, what did he play? Um, I don't remember. I don't remember. No, nope, apologies. I don't remember <laughs> what he played. But I did say it was a loud, boisterous group, and we were drinking at the time. Did, did everybody survive? Uh, yes, actually, we did. We did. Uh, we managed to figure out what they would do. Now, there was a good chance that one of us wasn't going to because he got sucked into the dreamlands before the cam, uh, 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 you know, by the camera. Um, but we managed to figure out how to get him out, destroy the camera. Um, and then we all booked it. And as we're booking it out of there um, in, a, in a truck, um, there was a, a, a chase. But it was a chase from these larger-than-life Hollywood set pieces so we had pirates in a galleon shooting at us broadsides <laughs> at us. Um, and that was like you know obviously from the dreamland we had gangsters uh shooting fake guns but they're shooting actual bullets at us you know it, so it was it was this real larger than life sort of thing it was kind really of cool, cool. Experience. that definitely seems like a really cool cool setup and like 20s hollywood just seems like a great backdrop for all kinds of all kinds of nefarious nefarious stuff. It's a shame that you only got those two games in. What did so? What did you, you were you just socializing? You know, talking to folks you hadn't seen in a while. Yeah. So <coughs> we always like to have a little bit of time to walk the vendor hall, but the vendor hall was quite small, so that didn't take long. <laughs> socializing with friends is always a big one. Uh, honestly, we'd never been to the area, so we also went out to restaurants. You know, uh, it's, it's always nice to be able to sort of see the area. Did you get some Detroit-style pizza? Uh, no, we actually went to a sandwich bar, um, but they served these incredible sandwiches. Um, so that was kind of really cool. I went to, we did, went to a burger joint one plate at uh, one time too. Um, so that was, I ate so much food. It was, it was good. Um, and then on the last night, so Saturday night, one of our friends ran a Morkborg. Ah, how, how did you like that? That was my first time playing it, and it was fun. It was fun. I mean, it's so much tongue-in-cheek. I think you're, what, you're rolling just these sixes. Your character sheet is very, very simple. Um, but it was fun just hanging with friends, having a drink, rolling dice as, you know, we're doing this mock walk thing. So that was did, you, awesome. did you like the setting? Uh, from what I could tell of it, but I mean... <laughs> Have you ever played Morkborg? I have not. I, I've I've read Morkborg, and I actually had I actually interviewed the two the two guys behind Morkborg uh, at the end of last month or was it the beginning of this month somewhere somewhere fairly fairly recently. Okay. Really nice guys. They're really sweet because they uh, you know with the time difference and everything they I had a late stream so or, or earlier than this but later for me so I think it was like at three thirty my time and it was like nine thirty their time and one guy was having uh, awful difficulties connecting but they were they were troopers and they were really really cool the setting is, is it just seems amazing it's kind of dark it's got this kind of uh, you know they, they they're they're from you know they're, they're from they're swedish so they you know they has a big kind of scandinavian sort of vibe to it but of course that's where they're from so it makes total sense but uh yeah it seems like a really fun um fun system i think for, especially for playing like a one shot like that where you just kind of come in and just kind of rock and roll and, and, and just really embrace all the kind of loony stuff that's going on Looney is a good word for it, um, but in a good way. Looney and one shots. Yes, it it's incredibly accessible. 
Um, and you just look at your character sheet. It's got ridiculous things in there. Like, you know, your weapon is a femur bone. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> your, your class is some kind of biter and you've filed your teeth into biting. <laughs> and suddenly you're like, all right, I can get into this character. And it's just like, go. And so it's, it's, it's like Mad Max meets fantasy. Oh, it is. And there's some, like, I don't know if you saw the tables where basically you can kind of, there's some sort of like a countdown basically to the end of the world or theoretical end of the world, right? You can, you can either be like two days away or a week away and it's like all kinds of horrible things are happening in the interim. Like it's, it's great. It was a lot of fun. Uh, did you, uh, what did you, what did you think of like the D6 kind of mechanics? Did you, did you like it? I was okay it? with it. In, 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 in the interest of a fast, accessible, easy game where it's just sit down and play as a one shot what beautifully uh any other any other oh i i was gonna ask and i almost forgot do you, you any swag do you buy anything in the in the vendor area did, were you gifted anything yeah uh, they had um cults of cthulhu um which i bought they that's not even on their store yet but they had it at the convention so i bought that i bought um time to harvest i think as well what is that um it's like a, it's an it's an adventure, um, okay. a, a fairly involved adventure. I mean, it's a book like so thick, so you know, there's got quite a bit going on in it. I didn't own those, so I bought them. Oh, highlight their auction. We should talk about their auction. Yeah, but that's one thing I did. So I I I have started going to the auctions at conventions, even if I don't bid, because it's always fun to watch the people with money bidding on stuff. Some auctions don't really have a lot to give away, or it's more tongue in cheek, you know. But they're still hugely fun to be part of. Well, these guys, Chaosium, raided their vault. Apparently, they have like a big vault somewhere. Like I can imagine it being a storage room somewhere, and they were pulling out good stuff. I'm talking about first edition boxed, still in shrink wow. stuff. And they had it, and it was across their entire line that they've ever had since the 80s. There were some incredible items. This thing lasted for about two hours. They had Rick and Mike um, basically pulling an item out. They would talk about it. The bidding would happen. Done. Next one would stand in, bidding on the next item. Boom, 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 boom. Everyone that wanted to bid had a number card. You just hold it up. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, you've got it. Take down the number onto the next item. They ran it like a machine. I don't know if they've ever done it before, but they did it really, really well. And uh, oh my God, some money was getting thrown at them <laughs> in that one, I let me it. tell you. And I was one of them because I actually I have a a spreadsheet of all of the items I own. I collect just Call of Cthulhu stuff. And I had my sheet out in front of me. And I and my friends, they had their respective sheets out in front of them. And we were talking, are you bidding on this? No, I'm not going to bid on this. I already have it. Okay, well, I'm going to bid on this. And we probably, between us, cornered 80% of what went that day to wow. the tune of about $12,000 worth between oh, yeah. us. Yeah, How, yeah. Wow. But well, you got some good stuff. So what? What were? You, what was your? What were your? Top I spent two thousand dollars on it personally myself. I'll just tell you, <laughs> it was a lot of freaking money. I over spent. how many books? How many? How many um, things? Is that... Well, actually, quite a bit. I'm going to do an unboxing video over the oh, weekend, okay. um, uh, because I actually ha uh, uh, had it just shipped to me, and it all arrived today. Funny oh, enough, nice. um, but the, I actually, you know, they had things like the original artwork from a, a book you know or uh, like back in the 80s and 90s before computers they would have to cut pieces out and arrange them mm. you know so uh, and that is what would then go off and go into prints and things so they had things like that and they had um something like that I, I, it was for call of cthulhu i forget specifically again i'm gonna have to sort of do my unboxing uh but i've been on that uh so it was like a once in a lifetime this is like the pre-cut version of like an ad that they ran back in the 80s so i was like i'll get that um i did get um, uh, horror on the orient express boxed and shrink i already have one but i thought i could get another one because then i could actually use it <laughs> 
But I paid so much for it, I don't want to break it open. So now I still need one. So that's ridiculous. Uh, so why I don't, wait, get, wait a minute. But if you have the one, in, so you have the one, you have one already. That's not I have two in shrink now. Oh, you, oh, you have two in shrink. You don't want to. You don't want to. No. You don't want to tear either. No, of I don't want to break either of them. <laughs> open. Uh, I did get gaslight. Um, gaslight. Uh, they, I think they only did a first edition. Um, boxed. Um, I got that. Uh, but I felt a little bit like I had to, really, considering the map that I did for them. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then I got then, then I got a few books. Now, there was one I really wanted to get, and that was uh, Masks of Nyarlathotep Sandbat Edition Companion. And it is a book this thick. Oh, no God. kidding. And it looked beautiful. And I'm like, I want that. I want that. But there were two guys in front of us that were out trying to outbid us on a few things. And one of them went in heavy on that. Like it was like 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700. And about this point, I was like, do I really want to spend this 800? And I was like, no, I don't. Oh, so we got God. it for like 850 and $900. It was, a, it was a good chunk of change. And I, I wish I'd got that one, but I wasn't going to pay 850 bucks for it. That's a lot. You know? That's a lot. Uh, is that one that's like super hard to find or something? It's just. They didn't make it's, it's going to be it. fairly hard to find. The thing is, with everything that they pulled out, nearly everything was mint or still in shrink, you know. Um, but then, if you had this, bought that, would you be would you want to open it up or would you be like, okay, that's the one that's mint? Well, now and I that's the thing, another one that I can at 800 dollars, you don't anymore, right? Because I yeah. would want to flick through it, I would want to read I, it. I know, you know? and I, I would just feel like I'm going to hit that spine and I'll have that one where it'll crack open and like you know, and I'll just be like, I just want to keep it shut, you know, the one right. Now. Right. But no, there were some nice little items that I got and other people got from there. Well, that, that's, that sounds, that sounds awesome. Uh, I, yeah, I, 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 I've gotten a bunch of stuff that I wanted over time, not in any kind of auctions like that, but I've been able to slip into eBay and, and things and, and find fairly good, fairly good deals. But one, one time I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, one day I'll be able to go on one of those conventions when I've got some money in my pocket and I can try to go after something I, I really I really, really want, but I mean that's another lucky thing about going to a con when it's in an early life cycle like that, right? Because there's aren't that many people there, and I mean maybe the people that were there were going to be ones that were going to be high, but you probably have better odds if you're in some percentage of 300 people that are there as opposed to some percentage of 2,000 people that are there. Are you're only going to get more and more people at the auction as their convention grows and grows and grows. They're going to keep pulling out of their vault. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to get a little harder, I'm sure, to get some of these items. That first edition, by the way, boxed set in shrink. Um, I forget if it was a particular edition number, but it went for two thousand dollars. It Oops. went high. Yeah. Well. So, and I'm hope, hopefully someone keeps. You know, that's the one thing I I, I love. Is I hope a lot of folks will keep. Or at least if they're going to keep it, you know, keeping it. I think you like that guy's house you went to in, in before you went to Gary Con, right? Where they're like, you know, kind of keeping it as opposed to just kind of eBay farming. Um, I find that frustrating, but that's another. What eBay farming? Yeah, just like you know, snagging up something just to turn around and and and, and try to get more for it on eBay. I mean, mm. I, I get it, we're capitalism, all that, blah blah blah. But you know, it it can kind of it kind of kind of hurt the day, the Dave says, "Ouch, too much for my taste." Or, yeah, I think or, all the collectors, or the collectors that just get like twelve plus copies of something, um, and it goes into a warehouse somewhere, and it's never seen again, and it's gone. It's just right. gone from distribution, right? That's one thing I, I will say about Bill Meinhart. He has no duplicates. It, it may look like it, but they're personalized copies of, let's say, people at TSR and that type of thing. So there's no duplicates. And his house is open. He invites people to come by and look at it and even pull some out. And he tells stories about some of them. It's like he wants people to be able to see the collection, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I like it, it, that. It's good to preserve stuff, but it's also, but not in the sense like at the end of Raiders, where it's just, you know, we're going to go into some warehouse where theoretically top men, top men right. will get to look at it. And nobody else will. But you know what? Guess what? We are at the, we're, we, we've gone through an hour. Uh, unbelievable. As it usual. always goes quick, my friend. It always goes quick. <laughs> Any, anything you want to, anything you want to promote, anything you want to talk about, mention before we, uh. I think we've probably spoken about it all. Hopefully, in the next show or two, I'll be able to show you a little bit of rivers. Hopefully, the NDA will get. Yeah, lifted I'm, on that. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look that up a little bit more. If you missed that, if at the beginning that, we, uh, that there's a Chaos Am announced that they are doing a game based on Rivers of London the series of books, Rivers of London, first book also called Midnight Riot in the U.S. for reasons that nobody knows. All right, <laughs> Alyssa. Um, 
I will hit you up on Discord because when I end the stream, it's going to play a video and we'll be muted again. Either you can hang out through that and then we can chat to set our next dates. Otherwise, or I can just hit you up on Discord, whichever is yeah, easier. Yeah, but... stand in chat. All right. Uh, okay. Everyone else, uh, have a great rest of your day, night, whenever you're watching or listening to this. Game on, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Ciao.